So this, this chapter is about functions in R, and I sort of think it's, um, part of it is about how to use functions, and then a part of it is how to write functions, I think. And for me, this was a little bit um, confusing in the sense that I wouldn't expect those two things to be in the same chapter, or maybe I misunderstood something. Uh, yeah, but nevertheless, um, as the as the saying goes, functions are pieces of code that you have to that you should write uh, when you don't want to repeat yourself. So I think in the R in the R world, there's a saying: Yeah, if you type something more than twice, write a function, and then if you use a function more than twice, write a package or something like that. Um, and this chapter has a lot of places uh, where Headless says. Oh, and this, this is something we come back to in chapter 12 or in chapter 15 or in chapter 19. So I think it sort of touches on a lot of advanced things where he is, okay, this is something you should be aware of, but not really until we get to that point in the book. Um, so, um, right, what are the basic, basic stuff of the, of the functions? Um, I didn't know any of this. Uh, apparently, you can use these three commands: formals, body, and environment to get different part, um, different part of the functions. And um, um, basically, the environment is uh, something uh, is the is what the space or the environment where the function operates and usually um, or executes. And then usually, all every function has its own environment. Um, and then the body function returns just the code between the curly braces of a function. Um, and then there is, a, there is another uh, sort of command which you, which you can use, it's called uh, uh, or I don't know how to pronounce that, in the function, I think this is, this is, this is useful. So I tried to write a simple function. Um, just to um, from the, uh, for the presentations, um, and I try to make this simple function function to sort of just the the average points of a coffee species, and I think I mean. When I was writing it, it's, I mean, it's obviously pretty simple. I use a couple of diverse uh, verbs to do some stuff. But when I was writing it, I was uh, thinking about, okay, so what I'm basically doing here is using stuff, things um, that, are, that I'm used to using, but actually they're, uh, what is interesting, and I, it, it, it comes, it, 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 that this, this becomes clear, clearer in sort of by the end of the chapter. Essentially, everything that we use, uh, or more or less everything that we use in writing in R is basically also a function. So, um, uh, if we try to run uh, on this on this function, if we try to run all of this um, sort of body formals, body environment, and um, get the attribute for serif, um, we can see the different parts parts of the of the function I think I can do that now in our studio thus I actually don't know if the screen changes when I change my or do you still see the the slides no nope, we're still on the slide oh, sorry how do I I have to stop sharing and then start sharing again mm, I'm not sure did you save share their presentation or the screen itself uh huh. Right. Uh, maybe you need to share your desktop so that you can switch between different. Uh, yeah, whether the yeah, you uh, can yeah. stop sharing and share your desktop, not only the slide. So when you share the desktop, you can uh, switch between the R Studio and the slide. Right. So you go to share, then you select share desktop. Okay, 
now you see our studio? Yep. Yeah. Great. So we go over here. We sort of do this. Right, and then I can do formals. Um, so formals will return the the arguments. Um, body will return the the sort of the the body of the function, the thing between the curly braces. And actually, I just realized uh, using um, using so that sort of will return the same thing because I actually don't have any comment in here. But uh, let's put a comment. And then they should return the comment as well. While the body will not. So, like, I don't, I mean, I guess this is useful for ins inspecting functions. I'm not entirely sure if you would, or I actually cannot think of any uh, context in which I would use this. I guess it's, it's, it's something you could do while debugging or anything like that. Um, so another another important thing or thing that is I think it's also specific to R because I haven't heard of anywhere else, but I might be wrong, is this thing called anonymous functions. And uh, anonymous function is something is a piece of code that acts like a function, but you don't really have to name it. So um, in our case, this function is called average points out of the points. So I define it with with the function, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And then if I actually have something uh, really simple, uh, in this case, um, this part of the code. So this is an anonymous function and it doesn't really have to have a name. Um, for me, this was really confusing because um, when you're reading code, it's it, if you don't know that anonymous functions exist, then it's kind of like, it's complicated, you know, you don't understand what, what the function call is doing here. Um, and the idea is that, of course, you can rewrite um, uh, the function, the anonymous function like this. So you can add the braces and, you know, the assignment and everything. And uh, then at least for me, it, it makes much more uh, sense or it's more readable than in an actual anonymous function, but maybe also what I learned although is that it, it's, if you have code with anonymous functions, you can't really test that. So if, you, if you're writing something in a package or something like that, then in, and you need to test the code, then you really, anonymous functions, I don't know. I mean, I, I don't think you can test that. So it's, it's kind of useful, but again, I'm not entirely sure about where or, or you know, accepting examples like this. Um, I have a question. So um, as you say, you're not sure when we use the anonymous function. So any person that can explain why do we use anonymous function? Why is it preferable? Is there any way, any place that we prefer to use anonymous functions than yeah, rather than using? The books as you can use anonymous function when it's a simple function and you don't really have, you know, you don't a name for it or you, it's too obvious to put a name to it. Okay, okay. So if you're just, you know, doing like a sum or a mean or something yeah. like that and it's All obvious right. from the code. Okay. You don't, but yeah. Mm -hmm. All um, right, cool. Okay. So the last, the last thing I think in this sort of introduction to functions is 
um, that you, if you if you buy it's like usually we invoke functions with function and arguments but if you have by any chance if you have if you have your arguments in a sort of a, a different data structure if you have, they're provided as an output from something else I guess you can use do call to call the function with the arguments um, so but but you have to provide the arguments in a list. So also here I was trying to sort of figure out different ways to use uh, functions in R. So I'm, what I'm doing here is, okay, create a list or get, get, the, get the first element of the species column that is unique and make it as a list, which is, over, I, mean, I think it's just complications because I mean, just for the example, it's obviously something you wouldn't usually do. But then if you have the arguments in some kind of a list, um, then you can do do call and um, provide the function name and the function arguments. So again, I think, I mean, I, I maybe, I just don't have experience enough in working with this type of things, but again, I'm not entirely sure why would you how would you come to a place where you have the arguments in the list? Or why wouldn't you do, the, do it the usual way with functions and, and arguments? <clears throat> I, think, I think it might become apparent later in the book uh, why we want to do that. Um, it may have to do with like some of the meta programming stuff where you're not sure what function is going to get called. Uh -huh. um, so you do, do call on a function and you, the user or the next person that programs will send through the argument, but it just makes it more generic so that um, it can handle different uh, functions. I think, I think it'll become, it could be wrong, but I think that yeah, I'm gonna see something like that. Okay. Um, so this is just some examples on how you um, you basically how you run functions. Um, so in R, it's obviously you can nest function calls. Um, assuming we define to these two functions square and deviation, you can obviously um call each 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 function as a as a sort of a sub function of the of the previous one or but this 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 becomes this becomes obvious to read um and the other way is to sort of have a lot of intermediate values that you say okay each time i call a function store does it mean very valid until you reach the end of the of all the all the computation you need to do and then obviously there's a tidyverse uh uh, pipe, which uh, I think once you learn it, it's quite obvious. But at the beginning, it's really it's really confusing as to what it does. So basically, here we are just saying okay, take x and pass it through all of these functions each time, uh, changing its value. Uh, to be honest, once I I sort of learned the pipe, I really like it, but I. I know there are some sort of opinions or reviews that say that maybe it's not the best thing to, for someone who sort of begin is, is a beginner programmer. So yeah, I don't know about that. Um, okay, so now at this point, at, at this part of the chapter, I think that the, this chapter became really complicated for me because lexical scoping, I mean, I, I, I don't really, really know what, <laughs> what the, the words mean, to be honest, uh, in, in sort of in computer science terms. Um, so uh, I, I read through the chapter and I think these four points sort of uh, explain it, at least for me. And uh, so number one, uh, functions look for names inside the function before they're looking outside. Um, this means that whatever is sort of in the environment of the function is firstly 
looked at by the function. So assuming you have two similar names or two, two, two same names basically, then um, the function will just use whatever is inside of it rather than outside in, in the global environment. But, and this is true except when the name is a variable, at least this is how I understand it. I'm not um, entirely sure because I've even tried to ask about this in the, in the um, Slack channel. And um, I think for me, really confusing part was, um, I was reading this paragraph for maybe 20 times. I'm still having a hard time understanding what is going on here. Um, so what he says here is, when you use a name in a function call, R ignores the non-function function object when looking for that value. So this is the sentence. Um, and when looking at this code here, I'm sort of, I'm, yeah, I'm, I'm trying to understand what, I'm trying to understand how this sentence explains this code here and I'm not, I just, you know, I'm not, not there. So I think we define, first there's a function called um, G9 <clears throat> that does addition. Then another function that has a name here, also G9. And then we call that function with that name. And when I look at the code, this makes total sense to me because I would expect that uh, 10 plus 100 to return 110. But then it doesn't make any sense to me when it, he says R ignores non-function objects when looking for that value. So if anyone... Like, I, think, I think it means that when you, when you write it in the way that it's like being called as a function, i.e. when you've got GO9 with the open parentheses, then it will not, then it will know that it's looking for a function so it's not going to, even though the G9, there's a G9 in the same environment, it obviously is ignoring that because it's not a function. So it knows it doesn't need to look for that. Which, which fits what, with what your logic is, with what your kind of in, intrinsic logic is. So then, so then it looks above the environment, the global environment, see the G09 function. I think just, I think, I don't know. Yeah. How I, I, so basically because it's been, because the call is, it's been called as a function, it's been, it's been written in a way where it's a function, um, where it's that second line of geo nine brackets geo nine, the geo nine in green, it recognizes that's a function because it's written as if it's a function because it's got those parentheses and the argument inside it. Yeah. So it knows it's not going to bother considering whether it should use the geo nine that's been defined just above because it's that's not a function so it's ignoring the non-function objects to look for the for, to look for the geo nine function right okay okay yep but i mean i, mean, I think it's weird and 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 not generally <laughs> advised. So. Yeah, yeah, I mean, I agree. He says for the record, no, no, don't use the same name. But yeah, I just, I just thought it was a strange way to explain that the function will use the value. Yeah, I don't know. Um, so uh, number three, Functions don't remember. I think this is also really uh, sort of intuitive when you think about it that each time you run a function, uh, it gets reevaluated. I think I guess is the word. So it doesn't remember what was what what was the output from the previous time, or what were the values from the previous time. And also, functions don't look for values until until they are run, which means that you can write a function and and um, even if there is an error in the function or something is wrong, you won't get, you, 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 there's no way to know this until you run the function. So basically um, the, the function that I have here um, 
right? I don't, I don't really have any data loaded. So right now it just sits here, but you know, it's not going to do anything until I run it. So I think this, this, this makes sense to me, but uh, I guess lexical scoping is just a fancy way to say these things in computer science terms. I don't know. Uh, <clears throat> right. So lazy evaluation of functions. I think um, this is also somewhat connected to the fourth point about functions not doing anything until they're run. Um, so basically functions are pieces of code they just sit there and regardless of whether they have syntactical errors or any kind of other errors, it doesn't really, it, nothing happens until you actually execute the function. I actually don't know uh, how it is in other programming languages, um, if anybody knows. Yeah, please, uh, please share that. Uh, but. I guess it's, so it's, it's I think C++, that. for example, when you compile, will give you errors if it hasn't been written correctly, uh -huh. even if you're not calling the function. Maybe in scripting languages, yeah. I don't know. Yeah. <clears throat> okay, so the promises part of uh, lazy evaluation, I, 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 yeah, I read that and I read it two times, three times maybe, <laughs> and I, I don't know what to make of it, to be honest. I. Um, I, if anybody has read this part of the book, please, please share, because for me it was, I, yeah, couldn't get my head around it. I don't know. It just, yeah, too complicated for me, I guess. So this is also the question I had in the group, right? Because this function sort of looks to me as the previous, as the previous function with the variables where um, I have y declared here and y declared here. And then this function returns 11 because it calculates 10 plus one. But then in function versus variables part, it, yeah, it just, this is just confusing for me. I don't know. If anybody has any insight. Uh, oh, I, I, I can help with this one, I think. Cause this oh. is one of the ones where I just stuck a browser right below the first line. And you can see how Y kind of Morphs. So here, let me share real quick. Oh, yeah. Yeah, this one. Yeah, how does that browser? Okay, Thanks. so for example, if we do. So y, we've got y here is the value. Okay, so browser, what it kind of does is it's going to stop you inside of the function environment as it's running. So now we've got a function, function x, and now I'm going to evaluate it. So actually, x is y here, which is why what it returns here is x plus 1, I'm going to call it, rather than evaluating 100, because y is no longer y. It is uh -huh. X. Does that make sense? Um, yes. a, a bit, but why, why does that happen? Uh, like, promises? Uh, can, 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 you, can you generalize um, what, why it, this kind of function behaves like this? Well, it's like you're, the, the value outside the function, you've got Y being 10, right? Yeah. I mean, going h o two of y, which you can substitute mm -hmm. as like two of x, oh, sorry, of 10, right? Mm -hmm. H O two of 10. 
And then that value of X then takes on the value of Y from the outside part, which was 10. Which is, oh look, it's an unevaluated promise. Yes, because, because exactly, yeah. it's, it's going to be evaluated once it gets the X plus one. So mm -hmm. the Y middle the on line three is a bit of a red herring. Like, because the, the scope of it, well, now we've given it um, that value, but the value of uh, X then becomes 10, exactly. So, like, that. Like, like, I think that the way, um, like, a promise works is that it's, it's like return data at a later point. Mm -hmm. um, a similar concept in, um, uh, in one of the JavaScript um, things, like, I'm a bit busy on it, to be honest, but, like, it's just saying it promises to return that data when it's needed. So, mm -hmm. yeah, that value of X, when you call X plus one, the value of X because of like the argument, which was then uh, Y outside gets the value of uh, 10 when you call it, when it's actually needed. Mm -hmm. Yeah, at least that's how I understand it. <laughs> Okay. Okay, so functions can also have uh, default arguments, um, which means that basically in the, in, the, in the function call, you can have something like uh, this. And then, then you can run the function um, without providing any arguments, just assume the, the default one. Um, and also, um, I think that this, this was a really nice part in the book where he explains about the missing, uh, missing arguments. And then basically, uh, what missing does is it checks for for uh, an argument that that is that is not that does not have a default value and provides a default value. And I, I mean I don't uh, it doesn't make any sense to me why would anybody use that? Because if you can provide a default value, then why complicate things with missing? But obviously a lot of a lot of base are or maybe not a lot of, but some base R code does this. I think that the example was the sample function, which, uh, which will, will provide uh, an argument if the sample size, it will provide the default argument with missing if the sample size is provided by the user when running the function. Um, Okay, so then there's, there's this also special arting, uh, the three dots, um, which basically tells a function that it can have any number of additional arguments that are not listed. Um, and this is a nice example also from the book. Um, so we have this first function that has two arguments. And then the second function that has one argument, which is X and then three dots. And then the, the arguments of the, of the first function are called with the three dots here. It's, I think it's also a little bit confusing. Although with, with, with this sort of simple functions, it looks straightforward, but I think it, it it can be it can be a little bit confusing. I think for me the the biggest challenge here would be, okay, how do I know which which type of or of arguments are valid in the in the dot 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 part? So if if I have any like a function somewhere. So, so normally, uh, I've, I've seen this um, when it comes to 
to, for example, extending functions. So if you're extending a function, or let's say like um, a, a, a geom in ggplot, then you know the function that it's um, using as input. So in, in that way, you, you can use, I've, I've seen people use this dot, 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 sort of uh, inherit or indicate that all the other functions that I, as, that I use as input in, in the other function I'm trying to extend uh, can also apply here. Okay. <clears throat> so, existing a function, how, how do we end the function call, I guess? Um, uh, the function can return, can well, return, display a value or be evaluated, I guess, uh, uh, with or without using a re an explicit return. Um, I I don't know if using or not using a return is better. Then also a function can return an invisible value and apparently the arrow assignment key um, is sort of the most famous function that returns an invisible value in, in R. And then, um, we can use stop inside our function to, to stop a function before it completes. And I think, <clears throat> I think for me, <clears throat> so this part, implicit versus explicit returns, it's, 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 it's pretty state for, uh, straightforward. Although again, I'm not sure if the first is better than the second or vice versa. So I don't know what could be the, the benefits of explicit, explicitly returning a value. I always um, do explicit. I, I didn't even know you could do implicit returns until like three weeks ago. Um, Cause I don't know, it, that seems very dangerous to me. And I imagine myself in three months time reading my code and being like, what the heck does this return? What am I trying to do yeah. here? Yeah, I feel like it's, it's, it's benefit is that it's so much clearer. Is there, is there, is there uh, some situations where actually implicit returns fail? Because that's, that's one, one, initially when I was running R, I could just, you know, implicitly return, but then uh, I had to resort to uh, explicit return because I was getting some weird errors I could not understand sometimes. It was a bit inconsistent. I, I don't remember the errors. Has anyone experienced that? No, what, what, yeah, I, I didn't, maybe we can try this. So I'm, I'm not sure what happens if you have a function that partly returns uh, implicitly and partly returns explicitly. Oh. So if I take this and say, if I take this and say, I don't know how it's supposed to be a C return. So what five? So it works, I don't know. Yeah, I, I don't know what, what would be, ex, except, okay, I agree code readability that you know when, when stuff returns. But yeah, I don't know. <clears throat> and then the exit, uh, the exit handlers part was again, pretty, pretty complicated. I, yeah, I don't know what,
I don't know what this means. When a function needs to make a temporary changes to the global state. So I think uh, part of like the global state could be the current working directory that's uh, being referenced by R. So um, in the example that they have, they essentially um, they change the the function keeps track of the global state of the working directory uh, before it makes any changes, and then the function does whatever it does, um, and then the exit handler makes sure that regardless of how the function exits. Um, it, that piece of code is run and then it effectively changes the global state to reference the previous um, working directory so that there's no like um, inconsistency before and after the function is run in terms of where R is pointing to which, uh, which directory. But yeah, the example was with, with working directories, but is this the only sort of use case for error? Uh, exit handlers or I'm not sure I'm because not sure. all of the examples are with working directors so yeah I don't uh, know. well there, there's actually one with options um, that that um, yeah it's got sorry if you scroll a bit down um, the I think you missed it uh, it's in the code block above uh, I just saw it <laughs> Um, maybe one more there and exit yeah. options. Yeah, so that strings as factors thing. Um, that uh, you know also you can like, you can set like the the number of decimal points like for scientific that that siphon uh, well like all the various like global options that that R mm -hmm. has that you might want to change um, within a function. I guess there huh, aren't so that many obvious examples because usually you don't want to be working with global variables in any case. Mm. So yeah. You're saying if my functions, if my function uses scientific numbers, for example, I can use on exit to say when the function exits, uh, restore normal numbers, so to say decimal numbers to the, to the environment or something like that. Yeah, so like there's the that option that I use sometimes um, that I just posted in the chat. Um, options sky pen equals um, yeah. 10. I know that. I mean, that's that's I think not to do with um, global variables, but rather to do with like the global state. Um, you know, uh, a scope like in the in the global environment, um, as opposed to this, which is then not really a variable, I don't think, um, but it's actually just part of like your your R um, like sort of global state. Um, yeah, so I, I think that's that's just one thing that like um, you might want to change back that for whatever reason if. If like maybe you wrote a package or something and you have to like change like the, the scientific notation or it needs to change directories or all that um, that use your package to like end up running your your function and then end up in like a different state to what they expect and then not know why uh, so I could imagine it has a place there but um, definitely not like uh, experienced enough to like, witness that firsthand. Um, mm. Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> uh, so sort of the, <clears throat> the, the last part of the chapter is function forms and a lot of things that don't look like functions in R are actually functions. Um, I also didn't know uh, much about this until recently. So everything we sort of type uh, like this, uh, uh, that maybe is like look like a symbol or something. I don't know how to what would be the proper English word for it. Um, it's basically a function. It's only it's only uh, written in a way that allows different uh, form to use it. 
So the, the most usual form that we know of is uh, the prefix form, uh, which is, which also I learned this today, that uh, the arguments can be matched uh, by name or even with partial mat matching. So, yeah, this is, this is, I think, useful if you don't actually know the fun the, the arguments or you're too, <laughs> or you're too lazy to look up the documentation. Um, but then, um, so the other function forms are infix and these are all the Met operators, so the plus sign, the minus sign, um, they're obviously also functions in R. And the, the, the pipe is also a function. Um, and then uh, also I didn't know about this, but uh, replacement there is a replacement form for functions. So names, the names function, which is used to rename the columns of a data set. Uh, also can be translated, uh, basically can be translated to all functions, basically can be translated to, uh, to the prefix form and then they look kind of funny, but uh, I actually, I actually uh, think it's, uh, it's useful to, maybe for understanding how this function works. So, Apparently, or I can just go to the examples here. Um, the plus operator uh, can be using using backticks can be re rewritten like a function. This is the function call, and this is the first argument. This is the second argument, which is yeah. I think it's useful to see how it works. And obviously the names function using two arguments as well, which is, yeah, I don't know. It's, it's interesting. I have a question. <laughs> yep. So <laughs> this is quite interesting. Um, I'm wondering if I, for example, replace um, like uh, an infix, the, what's it called, an infix function or um, a replacement function, does it mean that I'm actually redefining the already the, the special function? So in that case, if I redefine names, then I cannot use names as originally defined. I don't know. Like, I don't know. Like, why would I want to mess with that? I think you can do that because I'm pretty sure yeah, I've messed I, up by calling something names before and then having errors in my code. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I think I think if you define a function names, it's it's in as a custom function, and I don't think you will ever get to the point where you call the Built-in function uh -huh. because of the way R looks at, at at functions and and the environment. You first you get the things that are, I guess, defined in your code before they go, before it goes for names that are defined outside of your code. Mm -hmm. I know this makes any sense. But uh, so you won't get any error. I think I think this is in the in the in the dynamic lookup part or let's see. So yeah. This is the part, right? R looks for the current function, then looks for the sort of the next level and then to the next level and then so if you define the same if you define a, a, a function names, then I don't think you will ever get to the point where you call the built-in function. Yeah. 
But I've also unless, got, unless you do it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I've also got the the the, 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 the answer. So basically, um, uh, you, you you can do it, but um, it's, it's a bad idea. You can do it, but just in a certain uh, code block. Oh, I think this is what they're calling an environment. Yeah, I don't know. I, I think I think using the infix functions as prefix functions, it's useful for messing with people. Maybe <laughs> if you try to sort of uh, so if you try to do something like instead of um, I don't know. Uh, my vector right and then do something like this right which is the usual way then if you really want to mess with people you can do deck kick and then my vec vector one and then i mean if people don't know r or they're not familiar with this type of stuff then then we like what is going on here <laughs> yeah i don't know mm, cool i mean it, apparently you can do all sorts of things with big ticks. i didn't know that you could Yeah, but I I don't know what's the practical use of these of these things. Okay, so I think this is more or less what I have. I have the examples here. Um, so yeah, let's let's try to do some exercises, I guess. If if we're up for it. The mind blowing chapter. Yeah, it was a really. <laughs> I think, but I'm not sure that dplyr think... bases a lot of stuff around this back ticking, yeah. right? So, for example, when you pipe things and do select, and then you don't have to put quotes around variable names and stuff, I think this is how the dplyr works underneath the hood, but I'm not 100% sure. I was actually I was actually doing some I needed to just last week I just needed to do uh, six plots GG plots for uh, different categories and I thought I said okay that's like a function where I provide the title uh, using it on, as an argument so that I, I get I get uh, six different plots with different titles, and then the title is pulled from the from the data, which is a categorical variable. And then in, in the tidyverse, when you use um, there are places where you can use uh, names without quotes, but then the function uh, that you write the argument needs to be in, needs to be quoted. I don't know if I'm making any sense. Um, so here, right? I can't I can't make the default, or I can provide an argument that's without quotes, right? But if I put quotes in the argument and basically call call my function with uh, the, right. If I call my function like this, but my function, if my function has here instead of filter, because filter takes a quoted argument, but if it has a group, if I have a group by, and then group by doesn't doesn't take a a quoted argument. So if I do group by species, it will complain. It will say. Yeah, you don't. You haven't provided anything. There is no such thing in the data, because it will it will try to group by the quoted the quoted sign. So you have to do learn this also. I mean, it probably not. This is not relevant, but I learned that you can use 
Uh, I don't know if you, you want to be bothered with this Rolang sim, which is a function that would strip, I think, the oops. And then you have to use the ex double exclamation mark to actually provide the value. But yeah, I, I, I don't have the code here to show it, but it's, it gets really complicated real quickly. Um, so I'm not sure about sort of how Tidyverse is consistent with these things, or maybe it is, and I just don't understand it. Okay. Has anybody looked at the exercises? Uh, Where should we start? Um, <sighs> should we do one of the lexical scoping ones kind of as a warm up? This one's funny. Can you imagine writing something like this? C C C. <laughs> yeah. This will this will make a vector, right? I it makes a like a a named list called C. Huh, yeah. So it's it's a named list and then C is the C value and then yeah, a numeric vector um, with the name with the C name C. For that, yeah, for the first object. Right. So C is both the function and then also the name of the object then, and then the value C itself. Right. Okay. I have a question. So yeah. I, I always assign everything with equals sign. I don't use this. Does it really matter? I've always been doing it. And I know um, you're not supposed to, and I know it's against the like code of conduct in terms of uh, how you're supposed to write pretty R code, but I always use equal sign. It, it matters in, uh, when you use it in like your function parameters when you're calling a function. Yeah, that, but yeah. outside of that, does it matter? It's just in that that R style guide. If you ever see, yeah, you know, I think that's probably. I know, I know, it's in the style guide. I'm just wondering, yeah. does it matter? <laughs> I don't, I don't think it does. I think it's just that, like, yeah, it's just that style guide thing, and everyone's just sort of like, you know, okay, I guess this is good practice, so let's do it that way, you know. <laughs> it's just slightly more typing, so I just use equals. <laughs> yeah, this is shortcut though. I think. A control something. I don't know. That's or still more than one button. So look at this alt minus. Yeah. More yeah. yeah um, I don't know. I think it's more like uh, something to do with style, like a, like a conversion. Because when 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 I was learning R, like it didn't really matter so much. They actually, uh, you could use either interchangeably. But now I think uh, the conversion has changed. And uh, it, it matters a lot actually when you when you want to do the other way around instead of like having uh, less than and the dash you could and and you having code which also includes dash and greater than. Oh yeah, yeah, because you can do it the other way. Yeah, but I don't think there is a major difference according to me so far. Obviously, there is one. Yeah, yeah. there. Are... If we are to trust this Stack Overflow answer. <laughs> 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 we have slightly different operator precedence. Okay. 
<laughs> the ARC documentation is wrong. Nice. <laughs> Yeah, I don't know. I think it, I think it's uh, it, I think having the the arrow is one useful way to quickly see if the code is really our code. <laughs> so that's one of the benefits, maybe. Uh, Right. Do we want to try one more or shall we close it as we're at 7:30? We've lost half the group. Really? Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I don't know. Yeah, let's 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 just finish this one, I guess. Yeah, yeah. Um, why is this happening? Ten hundred. Oh yeah, okay, that makes sense. So two or two. Ten squared. Yep. This gets first. Then it's yeah. So it's. Is 10 it? squared and then it's 10 squared plus one and then it's 10 squared plus one times two. Should we um, can we do can we do multiple returns here or no? Oh no. What? <laughs> this looks like a, a, a recursive function calling itself. And this is and I think I think the f's the function f gets rewritten. So function f gets rewritten as function f inside of it. So the first function f defines then a second function f function f, which then a new function f is defined inside of it. It's kind of like the one we were going through, it was like g of 9. But this is the first one, right? The, the one yeah, that's yeah. mostly is the first one. Yeah, the first one. And then... So the first thing that gets evaluated, yeah, is x, x squared, and then that gets fed up to f of x plus 1, which is then 100 plus 1, and then that gets fed into that final F, which is then yeah. 202. Yep. Okay. Well, <laughs> it's 834. So. Yeah, okay. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry I wasn't able to sort of convey maybe in best terms everything, but it really gets quite complicated. Oh, that was a that was a super complicated chapter. I started looking at it, I was like, ooh, this is a bit more than a conditionals or control flow, if else. <laughs> yeah, okay, so yeah. Yeah, I'll stop for, the recording. Uh,